Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Wilson Terrell Jr., Dr. Wilson Terrell Jr., and I am Associate Professor in the Department of Engineering Science. I'm Michelle Johnson, Dr. Michelle Johnson, <laughs> and uh, I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Biology. And we want to welcome you all to the Life After Trinity um, panel discussion. Um, this is the second year we've, we've done this panel discussion, and this time around we wanted to open up to um, all students, um, uh, courtesy of Dr. Cheryl Tynes with Academic Affairs. Um, we have a, panel, a group of panelists here that will talk about different aspects of the transition from undergrad to real life. And so if we can, if we can have all the panelists uh, introduce themselves and provide a brief back, uh, a description of the Something background. About me. Okay, <laughs> great. My name is Christina Pickla. I'm the Associate Director of the Financial Aid Office here at Trinity. I've been in financial aid for just over nine years now. I um, was a financial aid recipient myself, so I wouldn't have been able to do my um, undergraduate at Trinity had it not been for financial aid. Currently in a master's program, and I am doing a higher educational leadership and policy studies with a um, well, higher ed <coughs> focus in higher ed. So that's me right now. Hi, my name is Chris Robinson. I graduated from Trinity last year with a degree in biology. I'm now a research assistant at the University of Texas Health Science Center, in San Antonio, in a behavioral pharmacology lab. My name is Pam Johnston. I'm the director of human resources here at Trinity. And I have been at Trinity in the Human Resources Office for about 15 years. I started in Human Resources long before you all were born, I'm sure. <laughs> um, 1976, began working in Human Resources for the federal government. So I do know my topic of benefits. Yeah. All right. <laughs> awesome. I am Twyla Huff, Director of Career Services, been in Career Services for 10 years, and I'm here to talk about negotiating salaries, so that's what I'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, my name is Paul Cox. I graduated from Trinity in 1994, uh, spent 15 years as an investment advisor, uh, and then came back to work here a year ago in the Alumni Relations Office. Excellent. So what we're going to do is we're going to have each of the panelists talk for about three, four minutes um, about a particular area um, that is going to be important in terms of transitioning from, from undergrad to real life. And so we'll start with Stina. Okay, so I am talking about loans. So student loans, once you approach your exit to the university, you will receive an exit counseling packet from our office. That will let you know the summary of what your undergraduate borrowing has been through federal, state, and institutional loan programs. So that's important for you to kind of be mindful of that information when you get it, any requirements that you need to complete at the exit to the university. And for repayment on student loans, you're gonna have at least a <coughs> six month grace period for just kind of standard loans. Some programs can have a, a longer grace period, but at least six months. And so once you separate from the university, which means that you're no longer enrolled at least half time, you have your grace period begin and then after that ends, you will be considered in repayment. And so with that exit counseling information, you're going to also be communicated kind of who the servicer is, who the loan servicer is for those various loans. That is the person that you now have a relationship with throughout the life of your repayment. So make sure that you have up-to-date contact information, uh, phone number, address, that type of thing. In this modern age, there is the ability, of course, to have the online profile and do payments online. One thing I will say is that when it comes to repaying student loans, it's a standard 10-year repayment, which that would be the exact same payment amount over 12 months for 10 years. That is kind of the initial repayment plan that students would be placed into you'll pay the least amount of interest with that repayment plan, but there are a number of other options that exist through certain federal programs, maybe the state, things like that. So it's important to have a relationship with your loan servicer so that you're aware of that information. If you go to graduate school, that's something that we're asked frequently, there is the ability to have what's called an in-school deferment. So if you're enrolled at least six hours in a graduate program, you're able to defer your undergraduate student loans. You don't have to be paying on them, which is what that means, um, but just be mindful that if there are interest rates associated um, with your unsubsidized loans, those will be accruing while you're not paying. 
I think that that's probably good for just a general overview. I know that if there's nitty gritty questions, I'm happy to take those. Yeah, so today I was asked to talk to you about finding an apartment, which is a, a good topic I wish I would have talked to someone about before I graduated because I just winged it and kind of messed up. Anyways, mm -hmm. so the first thing you want to do when looking for an apartment is to set a, a budget. So a good rule of thumb is to spend more, no more than 30% of your total take home on your rent so you can have leftover money for utilities and groceries and other expenses. So um, a good way to cut down on that too is to get a roommate if you want to spend less on rent, but that's something that you have to determine on your own if that's um, something you would like to do. There are lots of ways you can find an apartment. So you can use um, a realtor, but that costs money. You can look in the newspaper. But the most common way to do it now is to use online resources such as Zillow or Craigslist. These are really helpful because they have um, features that let you narrow, narrow down to, to price ranges that fit your budget, and they let you look into a certain neighborhood if that's something that you want to look into. And where you live is really important, so that's something you should look at. So if you're, you have to think about where you're going to be spending a lot of your time away from home, such as at work or somewhere. And having a commute that you're not expected or prepared for can really kill a housing situation. Um, sorry, that <laughs> <laughs> That's true about the commute. <laughs> yeah. So when you find an apartment, you're going to want to go on a tour with a guide, and you want to inspect this place as thoroughly as possible. You want to look for outlets. You want to look at the condition of the carpet. You want to see how the neighborhood is, because this is somewhere you're going to live for a year and be spending a lot of time. So you want to make sure you're comfortable there. So ask questions to your guide, but also go. Out, you need to ask questions to neighbors who live and live around there, because they can tell you things that the guide can't. Such as like if uh, a train horn sounds at 3 a.m. every morning, which is what happens where I live. <laughs> it's really bad. <laughs> but that's okay. You live where you are. And finally, whenever you you go to sign your lease, make sure you read it thoroughly before you sign it, and ask as many questions to the landlord as possible, so you don't get trapped into something that you're unprepared for. Ask questions and don't sign the lease if you're not comfortable. All right. Fringe benefits when you look for a job. Um, benefits can be just as important when you are looking for a job as a salary. They are tremendously important, <laughs> and um, believe it or not, and um, so I would strongly advise that as you search for a job that you also research your prospective employer's benefits information, which they should be willing to give you, or you can usually all, always also research it online. Uh, these are tremendously important add-ons to uh, your total compensation package, and some of the more common benefits that are offered by employers, of course, are medical insurance, dental, vision, long-term disability, short-term disability, life insurance, um, daycare subsidies, dependent care, retirement contributions, 403B for nonprofits or 401Ks, and um, e e all of these benefits, um, also sick leave and vacation leave, paid time off, also considered to be um, a benefit. In, in my personal opinion, the three most important benefits, there are lots of fringe benefits, some are more important than others, my personal opinion, is that the three, and this is just me, but the three most important benefits that an employer can offer out of a wide array of benefits are medical coverage, disability coverage, and retirement, the um, opportunity to participate in a retirement plan. Most common types of retirement plans these days are defined contribution plans, and again, those are 403Bs and 401K type plans. But why, are, why do I think these three are the most important, the ones that per perhaps you should concentrate on? Medical coverage, for sure. You don't want to, you, you may be healthy, young, nothing may be wrong, you may think nothing is ever going to happen to you, but it could. And just a brief hospitalization of um, less than a week can cost, these days, hospital, expenses alone can cost up to a quarter of a million dollars. It is not cheap. 
So you are well advised to make sure that you take your employer's medical coverage. <coughs> One of the things, um, you, you may not have to worry about this until age 26 because one of the um, outcomes or one of the good things that happened with health care reform in the last few years is that you can stay on your parents' health care coverage until age 26. And uh, I hear a lot of students say this sometimes, well, I don't even have to worry about medical coverage because I get to stay on my parents. Well, you can only stay on until age 26, and that will probably come around sooner than you think. So that is, that's definitely a good thing to take advantage of. That was a great thing that happened with health care reform. But when you do reach age 26, uh, you're going to have to be thinking about medical coverage. And when, when that comes, or if your parents don't have health care coverage and you can't stay on their plan, when you're looking at health care options, <coughs> it's not always, um, a lot of times we hear employees say, well, the most expensive plan must be the best plan. That's not necessarily true. You need to weigh yourself the total possible out-of-pocket expenses that you might pay in one year. That includes the monthly premium that you might pay, plus the maximum out-of-pocket expenses that a particular medical plan um, uh, might uh, cause you to incur depending on what happened to you that year. So make sure that you add all of that together when you are deciding what medical plan you are going to select. And honestly, uh, we, we have former employees, students, whatever, who contact us and human resources want us to, we can't tell you what to do, but if you would ever like to run anything by us, when you have a job offer on the table, we are certainly glad to help you with that. Take advantage of that. Yeah, we help we help people all the time. So it's yeah yeah it's 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 actually fun. Um, disability. The reason that I mentioned disability is that also when you're young and healthy, you think nothing is ever going to happen to me. And we even hear this from new employees that aren't necessarily young, but they are healthy. They never think anything is going to happen to them, but it could. Uh, you could be in an automobile accident, you're not expecting that. You could, uh, I mean, just something medically could happen to you where you are not able to work anymore for an extended period of time, possibly years. And with a long-term disability policy, what that will do is supplement a certain percentage of your income on a tax-free basis, assuming you have not pre-taxed the premium. So for as long as you are disabled, you will still be receiving a monthly income. With our policy at Trinity, it's 60 or 70%. So if someone became disabled for the rest of their life, potentially, or up to a certain age limit, they could have an income something happened to them, even at a very young age, they were unable to work, it's a non-taxable benefit. So that is a tremendous uh, benefit to take advantage of. The third one that I mentioned that I think everyone should take advantage of is contributing to a retirement plan. Again, if age 26 seems a long way off, I know that age 65 or 66 seems really far off, but it does come around, believe it or not, uh, yeah, sorry to break the news to everyone, <laughs> but I, I, I'm telling you, yeah, it comes around quicker than you might think. And if you take the opportunity to participate and contribute to a 403B or a 401K and you increase, the good thing about those types of plans is that you typically get an employer match if you contribute a certain percentage of your salary. And you can also choose to contribute more of your salary as you wish, up to a certain limit that the IRS has um, set each year. But what I um, 
recommend and and it really is amazing you can see your portfolio grow is that every time you get a salary increase go ahead and increase your contribution to your retirement plan by one percent you have never seen that money you won't miss it there are things you can live without and you would be amazed how your portfolio grows faster than that of your peers just by contributing that extra 1% every time you get a raise. And um, we see people who come into human resources who have kind of contributed <coughs> the bare minimum to their 403B all through their career. It comes time to retire and they find that, oh, they're going to have to eke by. They wish they had contributed more. So they are going to have to work until they're maybe 75 years old. They can't afford to retire. But those individuals who are more savvy and like I said, keep contributing more to their retirement every year, they can uh, retire earlier than their contemporaries and um, have a second career or do all kinds of things that they want to because they have been more financially judicious during uh, the years that they could contribute. And I'll conclude with that with kind of a, a funny story that I like to tell. It's a true story. Um, happened uh, probably, oh, about eight to 10 years ago here at Trinity. One of our, uh, it, it's a good story even though it's a true story. One of our, um, <laughs> it's just funny, way we collect these funny stories. Uh, professors who had worked here since the mid-60s, um, he had, for whatever reason, he had decided to retire. This was in about, oh, 2004 or five, so about 10 years ago. He had worked here since the mid-60s. He was a professor in the sciences. And so he came to Human Resources, and he asked if we could request from TIAA CREF, which is our retirement uh, record keeper um, uh, and um, vendor, um, a, a portfolio illustration so he could see how much income he would be getting each month. So that was requested, it came to his house, he came into Human Resources and he was really mad. And he said he could not believe that they sent him this, he said, this is just an illustration. I asked for my portfolio. And so someone in my office looked at it and he had um, um, over $2 million in his retirement. And he said, I know that can't be mine. That's just an illustration. I'm upset that they didn't send me my fund information. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so we had to tell him, no, actually, that is how much money you have in your retirement and your, your portfolio, your fund. And he could not believe it. And come to find out, and I guess he was just so dedicated to his job at Trinity, believe it or not, since 1965, he had never, ever, ever looked at one single statement, not one in all of those years, any of his retirement statements, no quarterly statement. He had just tossed them aside and he said, well, I just always assumed that teachers, um, you know, would, would live as paupers in retirement. And he said, this is, this is me, I, I, I'm a millionaire. And, um, yes, we had to tell him, yes, you know, it, it, it's good news to have to break to you, but yes, you are a millionaire. And so he, he went around the office, he came into my office, he goes, Pam, Pam, guess what? I'm a millionaire. And I said, you know, well, that is so good, and you're the perfect example of, you know, how you should invest in your 403B. But uh, that's a great story for um, anyone who um, wants to be assured that investing in retirement is a really good thing to do. So again, three benefits to concentrate on. There will be a whole array of benefits, but medical, disability, retirement, that's just my opinion, are the most important. So I will uh, take that and do a dovetail. So I'm going to talk about negotiation, and it's uh, negotiating um, your job. 
And so I, I like that it says broadly job as opposed to negotiating your salary. So I'll go from what she's talking about and give you a story of a student I met with today who um, is being offered a certain amount of money and has not been told anything formally in writing and it has not included anything about whether they're going to get health benefits, whether he's going to have a retirement plan, a contribution, a match contribution, hasn't said anything about sick leave or vacation leave. And so that's where we start the conversation. So one of the things that's important for you to realize is that as you go into the workforce, you may not know this, but many of you are going to be in a position to negotiate and not take advantage of it. Um, and so I'm telling you now, that's something that you do want to look into. Are you in a position to negotiate? There are some instances where the salary that's being offered and the benefits that are being offered that's it. That's all they have approved. That's all that they can be able to offer you. Or they may be looking for someone who's more qualified for you, um, qualified than you, and so they're probably not going to negotiate in those two situations. But in most other situations, you have flexibility to be able to negotiate. Now, are you going to be able to talk someone into paying you fifteen to twenty thousand dollars more than what you're being offered? Probably not. But there's a huge difference with you being able to make a negotiation for uh, several thousand or a couple thousand more than what you're making, how that's going to look five years down the line, ten years down the line, versus if you don't negotiate at all. Um, and so it's very important for you to realize that you do have that as an option. It's also very important for you to understand your worth, which is something that a lot of new professionals don't realize how much they're worth. They don't do the research. You can go to salary.com, you can go to PayWizard, you can go to PayScale, you can go to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is bls.gov, and you can look up salary ranges. And when you're looking at the salary ranges, that's what you're going to go in there and have that conversation about. The conversation does not happen until you're offered the position, so you don't walk into the interview and say, this is what I want, um, because that is premature. And so that is the ideal place for you to have that conversation when they're giving you the offer, laying out the benefits, and you say, thank you, uh, when do I need to make a decision by, right? And when they give you that time frame to let you know when you need to make that decision, that's when you go back home and you think about, okay, this is the range that I researched, this is what they're offering, where do they fall? Do you feel like it's a fair offering? If it is, then you're good. But if you feel like I bring more to the table than what I believe a lot of the people who are applying for this position bring, or I have specialized skills that were not even addressed in this job position, but I know that they will be an asset to this position. Those are the things that you want to take into consideration when you follow up with them, but you have to build your case. And something else that's very important to realize is building your case does not happen when you call them back to tell them that you want that position. You are building your case the entire time you're interviewing. So the very first time they're hearing that you have certification in you know, XYZ should not be when you're trying to negotiate that higher salary. That should have taken place during the interview. So really what you're doing in that part of the interview process when you're counter offering is you're reiterating or emphasizing again things that you've already talked about. And so I'll tell you, it's very important for you to know that number. Know that number that you want to have. Don't go in there thinking, I, I just know I want more because that is not helpful because the person that you are going to be doing that counter offer with, they know their number. And so you want to make sure you also have an idea of what your number is and you need to make sure that you're able to say, I bring this, this, and this to the table. I'm able to do this, this, and this. And it needs to impact their bottom line. It needs to further their mission. It needs to be something that they can see would be transferring into profit gain. And so you want to make sure that these are things that you're talking with them about as you're making the case for why you feel like 35000 isn't the number that you're looking at for this type of position and what you bring to the table and because you know how to do XYZ and will be able to start at this place instead of this place, you're looking more at 38,000 or 42,000 or whatever it is you feel is appropriate. You will also say this is the average of what people are making in this position and I feel like based on my skill set that that is the minimum that I need to be making in this position. In addition to that, you may find there are other things that you'll want to negotiate. So they may say, well, we need you to start on 
May 1, and you know that you already have a trip plan. That also needs to be something that you're talking about in the process. I'll be able to start in this time frame, and I'll be able to do X, Y, and Z. But just make sure you have an idea of what their goals are and what their needs are, what your goals are and what your needs are, and how those come together, and how you can communicate to them how that's going to be beneficial to them in the end. Um, they're not going to be willing to take any sort of wiggling with it if you can't prove to them that you're worth the amount of money that you're asking for. So that's important for you to know what you want. It's important for you to know who you're negotiating with. It's important for you to know what you're bringing to the table. And it's important for you to practice. So you don't just go in there and just this is your you know first time asking anyone for anything. Um, you want to make sure that you have familiarity with what that process is. So role play with a friend, role play with a career advisor, role play with somebody so that you are comfortable with those questions that they may ask you after each point that you bring up. And that way you'll be more confident in what you're saying and what you're presenting. And so that's important as well. I have a handout up here which is from a blog which I think is awesome and what it discusses in regards to six negotiating principles excuse me, that you can apply as you're going through this process. But really the main things that I want you to realize is that many of you will be in a position to negotiate and it's very important that you take advantage of that opportunity. If you feel uncomfortable with it, career services is available. We get these types of questions all the time. We get them right after they get the job offer and they call us like immediately like, hey, I just got offered off this position and I don't know whether I should accept it at this or not. And then we start asking them other questions and they're like, oh, I don't know. We're like, you're not even informed enough to determine whether you want this job because they haven't told you enough. Some employers actually do that. They will offer you a position and all they've told you is the salary. That's inappropriate. You need to find out the other things that they're being able to offer. And so you now are empowered to know about benefits and all of these other things that are essential parts of that package. And it's important for you to be aware of that as you go into this process so that you can set yourself up. Something else to remember, when you go into your next job, more than likely, they're going to ask you about your salary history. And if you didn't negotiate, you started at a lower place, what does that mean? You will continue on at that lower place. And so your progression up in your salary is going to be stumped because you didn't take that risk to try and negotiate. And you're all used to negotiating deadlines for papers. I'm here to talk about personal finances, and most of you graduating won't have any. Other than service and your student loans. Um, and, and to piggyback on what Pam said, the first and most important thing you can do when you do your job is pay yourself back first. Um, save in the retirement plan. Because if you, you know, if you start, if you have an older brother or sister and you start at the same time and they're three, they're three or four years later, usually if you're in, in a normal market condition, you'll double your growth of that portfolio in the last seven to 10 years. So if you start 10 years earlier than a friend of yours, you both get to 65, you're at $2 million, odds are he's at one. And you're the same age and the same amount of lifespan left to go. So start early. And, and the company match, there's nowhere else is somebody say, hey, for every dollar you save, I'll match you two or one or, or better. Uh, so that is hands down starting at 22, 23, as soon as you have the ability to do so, uh, do that. And before your student loans, before you rent a place, before you eat, before you do anything, um, <laughs> save for your retirement. Because I promise you, ramen tastes a lot better now than it will when you're sick. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, and then from there, it's, well, it's true. <laughs> uh, yeah, and, that, and that, that's, you know, and secondly is don't, don't overspend. You know, that, and that's the hardest thing is everybody goes through college and it's, you know, you're used to, I have so much amount of money this month, I know it's coming in and I know I can do this. Uh, and then all of a sudden you see extra and it's, it's easy to go out and, and, do different things, and, and I have 
plenty of friends and many times at the same, and, you know, where, and then all of a sudden something happens and you're like, well, I, you know, I shouldn't have done that, and, and by then it's too late. Um, but the, the save, I mean, saving is the most, is hands down the most important thing. Uh, I mean, it's the, really the only reason it's allowed me to come back to work at Trinity was, you know, and, and was saving. Um, and that, if, does anybody in here trade stocks, have a stock portfolio currently? <laughs> uh, the lesson I learned and I'll, is whatever industry you're in, if you're tech, tech guys tend to invest in tech, real estate guys tend to invest in real estate and so on. Uh, if you own nine tech companies, you're not diversified. If you own nine houses, you're not diversified. And so in 2001, as the tech bubble burst the first time, and I, I had, my income was based on stocks. My saving was built up in stocks. Well, the market retracted 90%. So I saw my income and my savings retract by 90% in one year. So that left me with no cushion, no income. I um, still had my mortgage didn't go down 90%. My car payment didn't go down 90%. So you make sure you get advice, not from your friends, not from your parents, but from somebody who is not afraid to be honest and tell you the truth and somebody you do trust. Um, because I didn't have that, and if I did have that, I would be a whole lot better off now. Um, and that was just one of those life lessons. And you know, it will come back eventually, but if, if something goes down 50%, it has to go up 100 to get back to where you were. And that's, that's the part that people don't really look at is, is if you have $10 and now you have five, well, you have to double your five, so twice as long to get back to where you were. So that's really it. Good advice. Okay, I'm Jennifer Mondes, by the way, I'm sorry I walked in a little bit late, um, but my um, contribution today is to talk about giving back, and so kind of along the lines of the financial side, it doesn't just necessarily mean when they call you for phone -a and say, hey, do you want to give to our phone -a this year, um, and you probably might not have enough money to do that right away. Um, it's not just about donating money, but money does help. As you guys know, it's not cheap to come to school here. and giving back to Trinity sometimes includes donating money so that students can come here for scholar on scholarships um, so that they don't have to choose a different school because as we all know, Trinity is, is one of the best schools around. And if they have an opportunity to come here, you want to help out by just donating a little bit. And even if it's just $50 that you donate, it makes a difference. Um, but there's other ways to give back to Trinity. Um, when you are finally out of here as an alumni, you'll be getting co correspondence about several things. Um, one would be like joining the Alumni Association and getting uh, involved in that aspect. And no matter where you are in the country, there's chapters uh, around the country. I think there's like 22 different alumni chapters that you can join and participate in activities. And it's not just meeting and talking to each other. You actually like, do activities together. Um, it's kind of like a way to build relationships and you can not only build relationships but get key contacts that people can, that can help you as you're out there trying to, to start your, your life and find your, your business, um, find your job. Um, there's people that are in all kinds of fields that graduated from Trinity and they may live where you're going to be going after you leave here. Um, and those people can kind of give you some advice or help you out. Maybe they have some contacts they can share with you. So, you know, reach out to your local chapter. Um, and you can find those very easily. You can either go on the website, on the Trinity website, or um, even on Facebook. There's a, a Facebook page for each of the chapters that you can, you know, like, and they'll give, you'll get the updates from them as to what kind of activities they're doing. I know here in San Antonio, um, the alumni uh, chapter does all kinds of just get-togethers, and then they do um, events. Um, Fiesta is going on right now, and they usually have a, a group that goes down to the River Parade, and I've never actually gotten to participate in that, but maybe one day when I'm not so busy in my career, I'll be able to do that. Um, but you, there's a wealth of, of individuals out there that have come through these same classrooms that you have, 
maybe you have nicer classrooms now than they do. Have <laughs> um, they can, you know, assist you in a lot of ways. And then there's also, if you're here in town, if you stay in San Antonio, there's lots of ways to give back to the university by participating in such things as mentoring students, um, coming and participating in panels like this, um, being a part of, of still what's going on here at the university. Just because you're you're leaving and you're you're done with your education side you still have opportunities to give back, and the university reaches out to us all the time. Um, I know recently I just did some letter writing uh, to stu students that are coming in, and those, you know, you, you have personal stories and personal information that students that are considering coming to Trinity need to hear, and they need to know that this is the right choice for them. And so by just writing a, you know, a little postcard letter about that big, it can make a difference for a student that may be on the, on the fence about coming to Trinity. Um, and you guys, you've been here long enough to know what this experience is like, and it's, it's one that you'll take with you forever. You'll, you've built friendships here that you wouldn't have built other places. Um, it's a very diverse university, and you want to encourage others, you know, to have that same experience. And so just by writing those letters, you can do that. Um, they do career fairs at different schools, not just here in San Antonio, but in other cities, and they sometimes ask for alumni to come and be a part of that to talk to people who are considering coming here to talk to parents so that you can you know verify that it's actually a good university and you survived and yes you might be in a little bit of debt but it was worth it um, so there's a lot of ways to give back um, and then just come and visit when we have alumni weekend you know come and be a part of that uh, they usually when it's like your five year your 10 year your 15 year um, reunion they ask for participants to help plan the events, you know, be a, be a part of that planning process so you even get to meet with your classmates again after some time and everybody tries to come back and be here for a little bit of fun and some good food. Um, and so if you're able to do those kind of things, participate. Um, there's alumni boards, there's positions that you can take in, in different areas that can help decide things that happen with, with the alumni association. and. If you even want to come back and actually work here, that's a good thing too. Um, there's lots of opportunities for employment here, and um, just it's it's good to come back and see how this university has developed over the years. Um, it may look like something now, and later on, you'll be surprised how many new buildings there are and how many new activities and opportunities there are for students. And so that helps you to see what you're when you're giving back money. That's where you can see where it's going to. Um, so when they do call you, don't just say, oh, I'm busy, I can't talk, or you know, not answer the phone. You know, answer the phone, and usually it's a student that's calling and they want to ask you for donations, but it's also your opportunity to connect with a student that is currently here and um, give them a little bit of experience from your past. They usually ask, is there a professor that you want to give a message to? You know, don't hesitate to do that because your professors do appreciate when you send back some love to them for everything that they've done. So. Once you leave, don't be a stranger, and um, try to participate in things as you can. Uh, life does get busy, but um, when you give back, it makes life that much richer. Okay. So we want to give you guys a chance to ask the questions that you have of the panelists. And Christelle, if you would collect the cards that, uh, that you guys have written some questions on. I see that some of you have, have written those, and uh, um, we'll be choosing some of the questions to ask the panelists, but while we're collecting those, I want to start with one of the questions that was emailed in to us beforehand. Um, there are so many, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to choose the one. Um, is there a time that it becomes clear what you want to do with your life? And how did you determine that after you left Trinity? So anyone who has a, a response to that? I'm on my fourth career, so <laughs> probably I'd say no. Uh, I, I, when I graduated, I coached women's golf here uh, for two seasons, and then decided that there, they, I wasn't getting paid, so I needed to earn something. So I, I moved to Houston, went into the investment business, and uh, did that for 15 years, and then got to the point where it, w it was, I, I was bored and tired. Um, and so I decided it would be a great idea for me to open a jewelry store. And uh, had a store, I was living here in San Antonio, I had a store in Austin, so for two and a half years I was commuting between here and Austin. Uh, my wife and I had a baby and that was 
not possible. And I uh, had ran into one of my old professors, to Dr. Walls, and he said, you know, you, you, we talk, you talked 10 years ago about coming to work in development, so maybe you should look at it now. I know they're hiring. And, uh, six months later, I was working here. Sorry to say Dr. Walls? Yes. Oh, great. Yeah. And, and so I think I found it. I mean, it, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of it's one of those things I don't think you really know until you're there. Uh, but it's, it's, been, it's been a great, a great year working here and being back on campus. I have the opportunity to talk with parents frequently in the financial aid world. And one thing that I've heard on more than one occasion from some parents is that I want to figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up. And I think that it's one of those things that's an evolving thing. Um, if I look at my own experience, I never would have earmarked working as a financial aid professional, but I stumbled upon it and it, you either feel connected to what you're doing or you don't and there has to be depending on your personality but that sense of mission or purpose or connection fulfillment and that can come from a variety of places and it can evolve over time so I think just feeling a sense of connection to what you're doing is important. Chris not to pick on you but I know that you're in an experience where that you, you realize some things that you don't want to be doing given the job that you're in and you're moving into a graduate program that seems to be more what you want. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you can speak to, to what it's like to make that kind of realization in your, in your own work. Yeah, so upon graduating I, I, chose a, I took a job doing something completely different from where I was trained as. I worked uh, with Dr. Johnson for a few years in evolutionary biology lab and I went and worked in a behavioral pharmacology lab with um, with drugs, and I found out that this is something I don't want to do. And it made me really miss doing the type of work that I had been doing in evolutionary biology. So that was kind of a, a nice moment seeing, like, oh, what I, what I did do was meaningful, and it was something that I am interested in pursuing for the rest of my life. So it, it was really a nice steering moment for me to see that the opportunities I had here really influenced what I wanted to do, and yeah. So if the a short time in the wrong position can be a really meaningful way to figure out what the next mm -hmm. step is that's right. Very true. Okay, and Michelle, let me, I just want to register with the students. There's a really great book called The Defining Decade. Um, I really highly recommend it. And the subtitle is Why Your 20s Matter and What to Do About It Now or something to that effect. But again, it's called The Defining Decade. And it talks a lot about the meanderings during your 20s and some, some dead ends, some places where you get to a fork in the road. and It's just a really, really great book, um, fast read and, and based on some interesting research and talks a lot about putting yourself in the right place. So if you want to make movies in California, you may be bringing people coffee you know, at the very beginning and you're like, I have a bachelor's degree and I'm bringing people coffee, but putting yourself in the right social network is huge. So I, I just highly recommend it for 20-somethings. Great. So I want to shift gears for a minute and uh, focus a few questions to Pam, if you would. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of questions about some retirement benefits, and I'm wondering if, if I can ask them and you can answer them quickly. We can get the information that people seem to, to want to know. So one question that several groups, several in the audience have asked is the difference between a Roth IRA and a 401k. Okay. Um, basically, um, a Roth is, this This is my basic understanding, a Roth is I can an... I help them answer that question too. Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> between a Roth IRA and a 401k? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, 401k is an employee, employer-sponsored retirement plan. So that has to be run through your employer. Um, a Roth IRA is anybody can do it as long as you have an income. The money goes in. It's already been taxed, so you can put in your three thousand dollars. You've already paid tax on that. It will grow tax deferred, and I understand there may be some tax law changes about that. But, but the, the difference is four hundred one k's are employer sponsored. So if you are not working, you cannot have a four hundred one k. If you are a stay at home mom, you cannot have. You can have one with, from when you worked, but you can no longer contribute to it if you're not working with that employer. For a graduate student or law mm -hmm. school right. or med school, you could have a Roth but not the 401k. Right, you can have a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA, yeah. but not a 401k. So a Roth IRA is not taxed? It is, the growth is not taxed, but the money is taxed prior 
And aren't there certain withdrawals that you can do with a Roth, like your first home purchase or? Um, yeah, you can there, and they're, they're, those are taxed, but and but they're penalty free. The yeah, um, there are slight variations in Roths also because, for instance, here at Trinity, we do have a 403b, which of course is the nonprofit equivalent 401k, but we also have um, employer-sponsored Roth here. But the 403b is uh, pre-taxed; it's tax deferred, and the Roth is taxed as Paul mentioned it's it's after tax the the earnings grow tax free but with the 403b or 401k they do not the earnings you are taxed on when you pull your money out and you're taxed on the money when you pull it out should a st student graduate should a graduate invest in a 401k if they don't plan to be with the company for very long yes because it's portable so yeah. if, if you're at one company yeah. and then you move you can transfer that balance over to the new plan. But it, it depends. Some employers have, unless this has changed, but some employers have different vesting schedules. You could lose your match. You could yeah. very well lose your match. Yeah, and um, so at, at Trinity, one of the good benefits that we have is that what the, the money that you contribute into your 403B is you are immediately vested. But some employers have um, a vesting period, like you have to work for them for a certain number of years for your retirement funds to be vested. Otherwise, you lose. You, you never lose well. You never lose your contribution. But if they say for every, you know, we'll match you up to five percent, and you don't keep their match until you've been mm -hmm. there through the vesting period, but you can never lose what you've contributed. What does vesting mean? We, when they give you a vesting period, so they say at the, if it's five years vesting, at the end of five years, you, you every, all of their contributions they contribute are yours, and going forward, they're yours. Okay. Christina, this might be a question for you. Um, are, there sort, are there any sort of federal loans available to international students? The loans that are available to international students, kind of the caveat with that is that there would need to be a U.S. co-signer. That, in my experience, has been kind of what the, the circumstances are. It would be more of a private loan. Federal loan, specifically education loans, that would not be the case. In order for someone to borrow through the federal government for education, they would need to be either a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident and eligible to submit the FAFSA application. So typically it would be some type of private. When I say private loan, it's simply through a private lender, um, you know, Wells Fargo, a credit union, something like that where they have an education loan product or a product where they're willing to consider that type of borrower. Okay. Twyla, you might be the one to answer this question. Is there a typical amount of time that you should wait to ask for a raise or how do you know when it's the right time to ask for a raise? Um, that will also depend on the situation and the um, employer that you're working with. Um, some of them will actually have that conversation with you in regards to like at Trinity University, you have, um, there's an expectation annually, but it's not a definite. And so you have that conversation. Typically, that's a conversation that you have on an annual basis um, through performance evaluation that actually is associated with it. And so you want to make sure that if they don't have an official performance evaluation process, that you have that conversation with your employer just for your own growth as an employee and because that creates a perfect opportunity for you to be able to highlight the things that you contribute and then have that conversation about a raise. And so I would say annually would be appropriate. Okay. There's a series of questions that, uh, that have been asked about graduate school, both in those that were emailed in beforehand and some of the cards here. So. Um, uh, I'm not sure who to, who to direct these to, although some of them Wilson and I can, can also contribute to. Um, there's several questions about the differences between graduate and undergraduate programs. Uh, and so, um, in particular, uh, one question is asking about the difference between undergraduate and master's programs, and then there are others that have asked about differences in undergraduate and PhD programs. And those are different beasts in, in many ways. So if there's anyone on the panel that would like to, to address that, and then we might want to contribute to. It's kind of hard to figure, uh, it's pretty broad. <laughs> it is pretty <laughs> broad. But I will say I just met with some parents who were um, asking a similar question. So I'll say, obviously with the undergraduate degree, you get the bachelors of some sort, science or arts. Um, master's degree, you would get a master of arts or science or an MBA. 
Um, and then the graduate degree, a lot of times when people say graduate degree, they're also talking about any sort of uh, doctorate degree if they're not talking about the master's degree. And so doctorate degree could be anything from your EDD, your PsyD, to your PhD. And um, it also is sometimes lumped in with the medical school, so you get your MD, or law school where you get your GD. <coughs> so doctorate is typically the terminal degree, unless you're doing something like art, in which case fine arts, typically it's the MA. Um, so that's one thing, but that question is, is huge. You don't always have to get your master's, and in most cases you don't get your master's if you know that you're going to get a doctorate of some level. But some people will get a joint degree where they'll get a master's degree and a JD or a master's degree in a MD, MD. So really kind of depends on what the person wants to do, which is the best pathway and what would be most appropriate. Sure. Chris just made the decision between a master's and PhD program. I know this because I know Chris. <laughs> um, would you speak to how you made the distinction between what you decided to do? Yeah, so I, I was offered a PhD position and a master's program, a uh, master's position, and I ended up choosing the master's program because I, I liked what the school was offering more than the PhD, and I knew that doing a master's before going into a PhD program, I'd be able to focus um, my interests down more and be able to get more out of, um, out of my education doing it a master's before I did the PhD. But you can, if you go to a PhD, that's obviously a terminal degree. A master's can be, but not always is. So if you want to see what, what if you want to explore more options, it may be beneficial to go do um, a master's before a PhD or something, and which is what I thought would be helpful for me. There are a lot of professional degrees, like med school, where your curriculum is really, really strongly defined. You know, you, you enter, you walk in the door, and these are the things that you do on day one, and these are the things that you do on day two for the next few years, right? There are other types of doctorate degrees. PhDs are very flexible. Um, it is what you make it, because it is, you focus on what you want to study, and you become an expert in a very small field, you become the world expert on the thing that you study, and you're creating new knowledge. So you probably take a few classes to make sure you've got some background information, but then you're going to spend years on a research project. And so there's a lot of flexibility in a PhD program, um, much less that is defined, um, and much more um, self-motivated um, inquiry into something that you find interesting based on what we already know in that field. And you'll have a committee of people who help guide you, but you'll meet with your committee once a year. You'll meet with your advisor, depends on the field. Sometimes once a day, sometimes once a month. <laughs> my advisor was in a different time zone for four of the years of my graduate program, so he bought me a webcam before anybody had webcams. It was a <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so it's a very different, you know, graduate programmed vary so broadly uh, that one of the big things I think between going from an undergraduate degree to a graduate program is often you're used to being told, okay, here's the syllabus. Here's when your tests are going to be. Here's when your papers are due. Um, and this is what you have to have completed by the end of the semester. You have a lot more flexibility in most graduate programs. In median years, you guys, between a bachelor's and a PhD, the last time I looked at it was it's about 10 years. So back to the lack of structure that you get with a PhD compared to a JD or MD, it, it, it's much less structured than that. And part of it is people taking a gap year or taking a little bit of time off. Um, we had a question about that, should you take a gap year? I think that's a personal opinion. I think if you're not rested and 110% ready to go into your next phase, I think a gap year is a good idea. Right until you sort out, like Chris did. What exactly do I want to do? But I think it because it's a big, it's a big chunk of time, and you know where you live and those kinds of decisions. It's a big, it's a big deal. And you might not be ready to make that decision six months before you graduate from college, and that's okay. Okay. Um, so I'm just let's see. Okay, if you're not able to work during graduate school, how do you pay your bills? <laughs> <laughs> well, you get an assistant job. <laughs> so one of the things that a lot of people aren't as familiar with, um, with the process of going to graduate school, with the exception to like medical school and JD programs, um, 
for the doctorate level programs, you typically can get an assistantship, whether it's research assistantship or a teaching assistantship or a graduate assistantship. And those come in many shapes and different forms and variety. They can include full tuition and a stipend, or it could just be full tuition, or it could just be a stipend. Um, and you're committing usually around 20 hours during that time that you're in a class, I mean, uh, during the time that you're a full-time student, you'll also commit about 20 hours a week to either the teaching part, the research part, or the um, graduate assistantship part. And so, yes, there are definitely options that you can go for, and I highly recommend all students who are considering a doctorate degree to look at those options because many people can get their doctorate degree without the financial burden that typically people take if they don't realize those assistantships are available. In the sciences, you should absolutely not pay for a master's degree. They should pay you. It won't be much, but it'll be something. In a PhD program, they should pay you no less than $25,000 a year in the sciences. You should not go into debt to get a PhD in the sciences at all. And if you're looking at a program where you would have to do that, you're looking at the wrong program. <laughs> uh, other fields in the social sciences, uh, the funding tends to be lower, but still available. Uh, in the humanities, it's tighter. Uh, but uh, it's certainly going into a master's or PhD does not need in, 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 in academic sense, right? Does not need to put you in debt. Now, there are a lot of professional programs that you pay a lot of money for. You're not going to get people to pay you to go to med school unless you've got some kind of really, you know, amazingly sweet deal. Um, but uh, you will go into debt to go to medical school. But you will not go into debt to, to become a biologist, a PhD with a Can I ask like a follow-up question to that? So for like a, for like a professional degree, um, that's like a master's program, so a couple years, two or three years, whereas a full-time and working might not be um, an option other than like maybe a small part-time job. Is there, this might be a question for you, like uh, loans that can be covered, can cover those kinds of expenses that are appropriate for that kind of degree? Definitely, as long as you're enrolled in at least six hours, that's kind of the line in the sand when it comes for, um, to loans. You have to be in at least six hours and when you are in a program there's always going to be a cost of attendance associated so that takes into account tuition and fees but then also allowances for living, rent, that type of thing. So once your expenses are met at the university that overage is refunded to you for those things. And, and for graduate school you can still continue to fill out a FAFSA to get uh, government exactly. loans. Which exactly. is something I didn't know until about two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the Federal Direct Loan Program, the Federal Direct Unsubsidized Loan Program is available for students who are um, doing a graduate program, at least six hours. Okay, the one other question from the, from the group that I want to make sure we are able to address so that the people here are able to get your questions answered is how do you find graduate programs that are a good fit? How do you talk no to your faculty? faculty. <laughs> One thing, the first thing that I would say is talk to your faculty, particularly your advisor if you have a good relationship with them because they know a lot about what you're passionate about and what you do well with and they also know their colleagues and they know different programs just from partnerships that they've been doing. So that's the first thing I would recommend. Second thing is I would recommend coming into Career Services to meet with an advisor because we also know of different programs from different programs who have reached out to us and said we want to recruit your students because we have your students currently already at our institution. Um, and we also do surveys at the end of the year that lets us know what programs Trinity students typically go into. So we have familiarity with pathways that are already being chartered. Um, and then we also recommend that if there's professional associations, that you go to the website of the professional associations and see what sort of programs they have partnerships with. If there are people who are doing research in an area that you're absolutely like psyched about, those are also people that you want to look at and see where did they get their degrees from. And if they're affiliated with an institution as a, a professor or something like that, you also might want to look at that as well. So there's a whole bunch of things that go into making sure you're going into a program that aligns with someone who you would love to have as your mentor or someone who's currently your mentor and they can recommend other options. I can pick it back off of that. Um, it's important to research the person that you, might, that you want to be your mentor, research mentor. That's very important. Um, in the McNair program, I, uh, I talked to students and I had them search people who they're interested in. And it was funny because one student felt that she, that she was stalking this person. She did so much research on the person that you know, she said, I just feel like I'm a stalker. But you want to get as much information as possible about the person. And then you definitely want to take a tour of the, of 
of the school. And not only just find out about the facilities, are the facilities good, but also talk to that person's uh, uh, research students. That's going to be important. Um, each person has a different style of meeting with their, uh, with their students. Some meet every week. I know one professor at my school had lunch with the students every week and one person had to present their research to the group. And that went on every week. Some people were more laid back. My advisor was more laid back than, other, you know, than others. So you want to get find out what their style is, how would other graduate students feel about them because they will really tell you the truth. They're not going to sugarcoat you. They have, they're not going to have nothing to gain by that. So they will be a lot truthful than talking directly to the, the professor. Um, so yeah, research the person, find out what kind of research, find out what kind of funding they received. That's important. If they get, if they have tons of NSF grants or go. NIH, <laughs> you, you want to go. If, if they obtain grants, those grants are to pay for students mm -hmm. to work with them. And so you kind of want to get that, you want to research what, what funding they're, they're getting. Because that funding, funding could pay for your education. And where you live matters, and it's perfectly fine to say, hey, I feel like I will be happy if I can live in this region of the country. That's, that's not unvalid. Some students, I think, feel guilty about, what, you know, I really want, you know, my heart's pulling me to the Pacific Northwest. Okay, well, look at programs in the Pacific Northwest, and that's not, that's not something to, to shy away from. You know, it's your life. And I, I think that's um, an important yeah, consideration. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I know we've reached, we've, we're, we're past five o'clock and there might be some of you who really need to, to move on. Um, I don't know if we wanna ask a couple more questions and people leave as they need to or? I'm fine with that. If anybody has any questions that, they weren't, that weren't answered, we can open it up for you guys now. Chris, I thought you had, you might have a question. Oh, that, that, that answered it. Okay, good. Mackenzie has. I have a very specific question. Um, if I'm taking a gap year and hoping to save a little bit of money and go to medical school, will that money work better for me in a Roth IRA and compounding interest long term, or paying off student loan debt for medical school and avoiding the interest on my med school loans? Where does that money work better? For me? Uh, it entirely depends on what kind of rate of return you get on the investment. Yeah. Uh, and, and also time frame. Rate. So if you're looking at, at a five-year savings, a Roth is a, no, there is not an IRA that's going to be helpful to you. Um, I mean, that, that's really a, how aggressive do you want to be in what your time frame is. And knowing the type of undergraduate loans you have also, if you have some of your, I guess, loan portfolio was a subsidized loan mm -hmm. that would then revert back to a subsidized status once you're enrolled at least half time. That's something to take into account also, paying off maybe the true interest-bearing loans um, that would continue to be accruing interest while you're in deferment. And those are things that your servicer could answer for you as well, just looking at the types of loans that you have. This is just kind of a general question, but how do you recommend a student approach a faculty or a staff person or someone in the community who they're hoping to make a social, um, like kind of networking with or a professional network with? How do you suggest that approach? I can tell you what would impress me a lot. On occasion, students have said, could I take you to lunch? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> we set up a time and, and, and go and then talk. And, and a student who, who approaches me that way, you know, I, I think that there must be something serious that they, you know, not serious per se, but, you know, a good reason to have that kind of conversation. So it may seem untraditional, non-traditional, but I, I think, you know, saying, hey, could I buy you a cup of coffee? Could we meet and talk in Java City for a few minutes um, would be perfectly appropriate to ask a professor. And maybe anybody else do. <laughs> it's also helpful to emphasize the connection. Um, so Professor Sessions just said I should talk to you. Or I noticed that you're doing da-da-da, and I'm really excited about learning more about that. Um, because one of the things that most people want to know is why this person is talking to me, so I can figure out how I can best help them, if I can help them. So if you can make that clear pretty early on, that's very helpful. It, it, to expand on that a little bit more generally, most of the faculty on this campus have been here a really long time. And if you're talking about somebody here in San Antonio that's 
maybe a community member, there's a good chance somebody on this campus that you know pretty well knows that person pretty well. Uh, so I'm gonna ask. I mean, we get calls in the alumni office from you know recent grads or two years out, five years out. You know, I'm, I'm in this business, I really need to meet so-and-so. I know he went to school at Trinity, can you help me make an introduction? Um, and I've never had anybody say no. You know, any, anybody who's established in the community is, especially for, for people graduate, right, just graduating or in school, uh, will bend over backwards to help them. I think asking people, people like to be consulted for advice. <laughs> And they like to, to be asked questions. And so I think, you know, asking people sincere questions where you've maybe done a little bit of stalking beforehand, <laughs> right? So that you, you know what they're interested in, and back to Twyla's point and making those connections. But I think um, telling them, I just need five or ten minutes of your time, maybe I, you don't have, they don't have time for the lunch. Um, but I think asking people questions is the thing that I wish all of you knew to do. because. You can be meeting with somebody famous, one of our distinguished lecturers in Lori, and sometimes students are like, how do, I, how do I interact with these people? Ask them questions. It takes the pressure off of you, right? You don't have to perform. You just have to listen to what they're saying, and, and that starts the connection, I think, between the two people. Um, and back to the defining decade, where it's just sort of, that's a social network that you're tapping into. But you, you ask questions, and they will be every bit as impressed with you as you are yeah. with them. Mm -hmm. And you, it, it's it's hard to get over that initial impression, um, but that's that's always the case. And I'll also promote LinkedIn because it's a great yeah. way to stalk people. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to know a little bit more about this person before you're meeting with them, you can look them up and see if they have a profile. But the other beautiful thing about it is if you're part of the Trinity University Alumni Network, which all of you in here should be, because you don't have to be an alum to be part of that network on LinkedIn, then you can also look that person up and see if any of your current connections are connected to them. And again, going back to what Paul was saying, you can see if maybe they would do the introduction. One net, I'll be quick. A networking story that I tell my research students uh, uh, that, I, that may be encouraging to you. Uh, when I was a graduate student, I went to a conference and I uh, had this short list of people that I really wanted to meet. And one of them was Henry John Alder. And I really wanted to talk with him. I was so impressed with his work. I just loved the kind of stuff he was doing. And I wanted him to know who I was. And I just chased him all over the conference. And I never got a chance to talk with him because he was always surrounded by people, like all these clump of people around him all the time. And I was just kind of upset that I wasn't able to, to see him at this like four-day conference. I could never find time to talk to him. And I'm leaving the conference. I've like, got my suitcase, and I'm leaving. you know. And who comes running up behind me yelling my name but Henry John Alder, I've been trying to find you this whole conference. I wanted to talk to you about your work. <laughs> so it can feel so intimidating. I felt so intimidated. This guy was a giant, is a giant in my field, and I was so intimidated to go talk with him, and yet he had actually, lo and behold, wanted to talk to me too, and we just hadn't found a way to connect. So um, don't. Yeah, be, be, you know, be a little bit bold, <laughs> and it can, you can really pay off. And you had a question. Um, yeah, so thinking about taking a gap year and then applying for grad school next year, so would you recommend getting professors' recommendations now before I leave, or coming back a year later and trying to get your recommendations then? I usually tell students just to stay in contact with their professors. And so I say, if you know you're going to graduate school, you should be having that conversation with your faculty now so that they'll know. And asking them now if they'll write your letter of recommendation so that they'll be aware of this. And then give them updates. So if you're working, let them know what you're going to be doing as soon as you secure that position. And it may be a few months in, letting them know something else that's happened on the job. But just you know, keeping them connected to you so that your letter of recommendation won't be something that was like a year or two ago. Um, it's very important to stay connected with them. And you won't get the letter, right? You can ask for a letter now. But I'm not going to write a letter and give it to you so that you can send in later. You won't see your letters of recommendation. Mm -hmm. And if you're asked if you are willing to waive your right to see the letters, you should waive your right unless you have a very specific reason not to because it's really a red flag if a student insists on being able to see what recommendations say about them. So you should talk with the professors or, or community members, whoever it is, is writing your letter. Make sure that you feel like they have a good sense of who you are and what your goals are and that they 
that you know they know you so that they mm -hmm. will write, a, you know, the, the great things about you that, that the person who's evaluating you should know. Uh, but then you should waive your right um, to, to see those letters. And also, make sure that you get a recommendation or request a recommendation from, from a faculty member who you did well in the class. <laughs> right. That's important. That's very important because we just don't write recommendations for anybody who has. Trust me. I've had people ask me for recommendations, and I'm serious. If I feel like I can't give a good, good recommendation for the candidate, I'm going to let them know up front. So make sure that you can, can obtain a, a quality recommendation. So that means getting to know your professors. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't have to kiss their behind, but you want to have, you, you want them to remember you. And I have a, a, I remember like I went to University of Illinois. The chemistry course there had like 300 people in a section. Um, I, asked this, I asked one of the faculty members for a recommendation for graduate school. And this was like four years after I took the class. She remembered me because I sat in the front and I always asked questions in a room of 300 people. And so that's how she, you know, so make sure that the person knows you well. Um, here you won't have that problem because I don't believe there's any classes with 300 people. I hope not. Um, so you have a better opportunity to connect with the, with the faculty members. And that's what that's one of the beauties of training. So take advantage of that if you're looking to you know, go to graduate school or if you're going to work also because you know we'll write recommendations either or for graduate school or for permanent employment. Or we have friends who are looking for someone to work in a particular position in their company and they ask, Do you know any students who are interested in? Mm -hmm. You know, and if I know you and I know what you're interested in and there's an overlap there, well I'm able to suggest your name. Maybe there's not even an application process for some of those things. Um, Twyla mentioned the LinkedIn alumni group. Um, I was wondering if there's a way to see like specific industries on there or maybe something in the alumni office because I just was looking at every single person and looked at the title to see if they were relevant, but I feel like that wasn't very efficient. On the search on the left hand, there's an option for you to narrow it down by industry, by geographic location. Oh, okay. um, I guess it's not very specific. It's not, LinkedIn is very overwhelming um, when you first get into it. I had it for like two years and did nothing with it. Um, and then everybody in the industry started screaming LinkedIn and so I was like, oh, better know what that's about. Um, but if you have questions like that, you can actually come in and meet with us and we can show you how to navigate the whole thing. But on the left-hand side, you can narrow it down by industry. And that's one of the basic, so free um, account options. And you can call, you can call us in the alumni office. Yeah, I was, like, I'm looking for something very specific, so maybe I should just talk to the alumni office. They do have a database, like, so LinkedIn um, alumni group is 5,400 alumni. Their database is 20, over 24,000 alumni. So I would never say use one exclusively. Um, the ones on LinkedIn are typically a little bit more active, but obviously the alumni database is humongous. Um, and so you can definitely call over there. Elizabeth uh, usually will walk people through how to sign into it and, and use it. I guess I'm pretty, for, well, for anyone in, in the undergrad is pretty fortunate that there's scholarships and available for undergraduate programs. But when I was applying for grad school, there isn't, and I even called, they don't give out scholarships. They don't uh, either, what if I don't get a graduate assistantship and I don't want to take out loans? Why is it that there's, there's not any scholarships available in grad programs? Why is that less frequent when taking a grad program? Well, there's companies that you can go sign a contract and work for a certain amount of time and they'll, over that time, forgive your, pay your loans off. Uh, at least in business, I know that that's the case. Yeah, it can be a benefit. I think it really just depends on the field, mm -hmm. kind of what Jennifer was saying earlier. Um, you know, some fields, there are grants, so there's more money available, but at the graduate level, I mean, I can speak from a financial aid standpoint. You know, you mentioned you didn't want to take out loans, but when it comes to the FAFSA application and available financial aid, the intention of financial aid is that students get their first undergraduate degree. And so really the landscape of available funding is from a government and state perspective changes drastically at that graduate level. So 
from a university perspective, I guess it really just depends on available resources and you know the programs themselves. I don't know if this was an internal or a different university, but um, I don't have an exact answer for why it is more of a challenge. I, I think it's more of a challenge because there are fellowships, opportunities, and so there's going to be less of scholarships. There are some scholarships out there. Some universities have scholarships for graduate school, but mostly it's going to be either uh, a resident uh, 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 RA, a TA, or a GA position a lot, a lot of times. And they're a lot more competitive. Mm -hmm. There's really no sense that everybody should be able to get a graduate degree. And there is a strong sense that everybody should be able to get an undergraduate degree, um, you know, meeting some academic bar that then money shouldn't keep qualified students from being able to get a, an undergraduate degree. But there's not that sense with, with graduate degrees. I think the key thing is talk to the, whatever school you're looking at, is talk to the uh, graduate, graduate advisor, um, either at the university as a whole, or each, some universities have like colleges, like college engineering, college of arts. You might want to talk with the, the graduate advisor um, in that area. Okay. And something else, if you're talking about my alma mater, is that they have assistantships in other areas. Um, so if you're planning on going there, you should definitely look at other departments. Because when I did my assistantship, there were like people from two different programs outside of my graduate program um, that they were able to do assistantships. And again, they, there the assistantship did pay for the tuition and you got a stipend. So if that's still something you're considering, you should look at that. All right, well you guys have been a great audience. You've been a great panel. Let's thank the panel. and.